Okay, my name is Robert Worrell. Uh, I'm 62 years old, and my drug of choice is methamphetamine. Well, my use uh, began at the age of 14. Uh, started off like a lot of folks back then with marijuana uh, and some alcohol. And as my life progressed, I tried various drugs. Uh, I was always uh, one who enjoyed uh, drug use, uh, but became addicted to them probably in my 20s is when I became dependent on substance. And then methamphetamine was a drug that I uh, didn't get involved with until probably my age of 40. And, uh, and my clean date would have been the age of 50. But during that 10 years, uh, that's the drug that brought me to my knees. Well, uh, methamphetamine, uh, what I hated about it most um, was the fact that uh, starting off with it, 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 was, it seemingly was innocuous. Uh, again, I was a partier all my life. And when I started using methamphetamine, uh, really, I had gone into a construction trade, and I was at the age of 40. Uh, I was smart enough, and I was strong enough, but I wasn't really capable of necessarily keeping up with my fellows on the job. So I found out that by using methamphetamine that I could keep up with the youngsters and kind of be on top of my game. So I thought, well, this is a great sort of equalizer. And it started off uh, kind of like a liar is really what uh, bothered me the most about it, was it, it gave me a false sense of... Uh, superiority, a uh, uh, false sense of uh, uh, superior well-being physically, and uh, that I was mentally sharp, you know, at all times. And, and, uh, and of course, that's, that's not the way methamphetamine works. So I, I think my biggest hatred of it is that it started off as a drug that, that truly is very deceptive and, and fools people. I considered myself to be relatively uh, intelligent enough to, to understand these things, but but truthfully, as I got more deeper into the, the drug itself, I became more dependent upon it. My entire life revolved around it, and all the aspects that were beneficial at the beginning just, just circled and cycled down the drain. So uh, I think with that said is probably the aspect that I hated about it worse. Well, the effects on the body over time, uh, again, starting off, uh, you know, it gives you a false sense of power and of strength and that... Uh, that really physically you're doing uh, superior to what you were before. Over time, uh, I guess the long-term effects, because in my case, in my use, I, was, uh, I, I snorted uh, methamphetamine, and, uh, and not really in large quantities, but I would do it sort of on a daily basis, kind of in the morning. And uh, it got to where uh, physically it was uh, draining me. Instead of giving me energy, I actually ended up with a lack of energy. And I found myself, uh, like most addictive cycles, having to take more and more to accomplish the same effect. In the meantime, I started losing weight. I was getting more uh, anxious. I'd be more tense uh, rather than confident. My, uh, you know, my uh, whole outlook turned to uh, one of fear. Uh, I started realizing that it was becoming a habit that I could no longer just do it to provide me with... Uh, extra energy, I was now needing it to provide me with just uh, sufficient energy to even get through the day. Uh, my eating habits got out of uh, whack. I lost uh, weight. Uh, I got um, paranoid. Uh, yeah, and in the end, uh, physically, it, it uh, uh, probably brought me down to about 125 pounds. Uh, lost a lot of weight. Uh, ended up starting to have uh, teeth problems. Uh, and then I switched at the end from snorting it to smoking it. And then some other folks that I knew were eating it, which, you know, and so I pretty much tried every way of consumption it. I never did shoot it up. Uh, so I, I never was uh, a needle user with any of my uh, drug history. But nonetheless, uh, yeah, my consumption rate went up. The cost went up. And I found myself basically uh, needing to... Um, almost go to work on Mondays when I started off using meth was to be able to complete the day. And by the end, it was like I needed to get back to work on Monday so I could sober up because my entire funding, my whole life started revolving around purchasing, consuming, and uh, doing methamphetamine. Well, um, sense of uh, self-worth, uh, you know, um, sort of went by the wayside. Uh, yeah, you, you, when, as you become more and more of a slave to substance and, and you realize that that's what, kind of where the place is where you're at, it's difficult to confide in other people about where you're at with that, uh, even though many of the people you're consuming it with 
uh, may not see that, and you, you start feeling isolated even amongst friends or people you presume to be friends. And then isolation, you realize it in your dependence that uh, that uh, you're you're really not acting in a social, moral, or uh, appropriate uh, ways of behavior have, have all kind of gone by the wayside because your struggle is when to get the next fix so that you can uh, maybe perform through the next day and after a while it, it's like you're you're a two people you know you're a persona that you publicly have lived with all your life trying to maintain that but inside you're, you're driven by this this just need to uh, you know perpetuate your high oh my god um, oh to keep it a secret <clears throat> or you know to keep it maintained uh, it's a lot. Um, yeah, I, I was in a smaller community and I was pretty well known throughout that community. So, uh, uh, I knew that there was an expectation that I was not that person, but as I slowly progressed into, into the, uh, the, you know, the pitfalls of, of truly being addicted, I realized that, uh, uh, it, it took a lot of work, a lot of lying a lot of uh, dishonesty, a lot of uh, untruth, a lot of deception to uh, make people feel, make other people feel that I was okay. And the part that was difficult about that is in, inwardly, you know you're not. And outwardly, you have a hard time facing that with other people. So it becomes difficult to reach out to anybody, so you end up spending a whole lot of time just trying to act like the person that you think you might have used to have been. But in the meantime, truthfully, the facade is stripped away. It's another effect of methamphetamine over time, was there's no way to really hide it, but you, you try so hard to do that. So I think many people were surprised, but many others were not. In fact, when I finally did get sober, many people were like, we were wondering when that was going to happen. And I was like, you knew? And they go, oh, of course we knew. We knew, we knew for many years. Uh, well, that was probably the worst. I mean, uh, among my other, uh, you know, when I say methamphetamine was my drug of choice, the original question I have a long history of drug use uh, throughout time, and so I'd had an experience with cocaine that was not good in the, in the early 90s. And there's an effect of jonesing, which is what makes people go back to cocaine. Uh, I, I'm actually grateful that that, that was a one-year experience, one and, one and done. Uh, the jones of methamphetamine is, is a similar thing. It's just you, you get to a point where you hate it so bad that you, that you just do not want it and you can't live with it. But as you withdraw and you try to separate from it, you realize that you also almost can't live without it. And that's where you're caught in that, that's, it's a, a paradox. And uh, yeah, it's just darned if you do and darned if you don't. And uh, so you don't know which way to go. And it's just a real desperate, uh, anxious, tense feeling. And it was nothing that I could really handle on my own because the whole difficulty is, it's an available situation anywhere. Wow, that's a good one. Um, yeah. Uh, well, uh, absent war stories, which is what we're not here to tell. Methamphetamine, um, <clears throat> there's a breakdown of, uh, of uh, the, the false sense of reality that it creates in, in, your, uh, in your mind, imaginations, and the, in the uh, original thinking that somehow you're, you're all powerful and, and in many ways. So... Uh, I think some exam best examples of, of how you would lose yourself is, uh, you know, I, I was raised, I, I would say, pretty much like most people. I had great parents. I had a, a decent background. Uh, you know, I, there was no, I didn't do these things, and my substance abuse wasn't driven by uh, some sort of trauma or any kind of abuse or, you know, and, and my heart goes out to those who certainly have that in their history. Mine was pretty much a normal background of a partier, but as I started partying, the values that I was raised with of caring for other people uh, went out the window. It's a, it's a very selfish experience uh, when you're addicted to any kind of substance. Uh, I think more than anything else, it's, it's very narcissistic and very, very, very selfish. So you don't really care about the others in your life that you, that you would or used to care about. Uh, relationally, uh, you know, uh, it, it's hard to qualify this without a, a greater, deeper story, but uh, let, let's just say that uh, emotionally uh, with uh, females, for example, uh, relations with the other sex, opposite sex, it was always about caring about the other person and always about uh, being sensitive to their needs. But as you get addicted to substance and you get addicted to any type of uh, 
of uh, desire, uh, then my moral compass turned from being a person who cared about others to one who was taking from others. And uh, so in a sense, it, it's, it, it, it leads to a form of depravity that you really don't recognize because you're, you're really just in pursuit of, uh, of all forms of pleasure, and that could be including carnal, which seems to relate a lot to drug use. Oh, well, um, no doubt it is impossible to keep promises uh, with people that you make and uh, loved ones, family, and uh, et cetera. But in the end, what I found was it's impossible to uh, keep even a minimal promise to even myself. You know, even as uh, one is exploiting the situation in the world for selfish purposes, I was always able to accomplish things for my own needs, and I always felt like I had the will that, you know, I can do this if I set my mind to it. And I would promise myself, myself things, and I couldn't even accomplish that. Uh, in the meantime, I, you know, as far as accomplishing or meeting goals or expectations of other people, uh, what became promises actually then became lies. And that was part of the unraveling and the discovery that, that I could no longer say what I meant and mean what I say or follow through with the things that I, that I said that I would do. Uh, and that was economic, it was family, it was all aspects of life, work, you know, play, pleasure. <laughs>I knew I needed help uh, probably, I'm going to say, three years before I got help um, is when I, when I knew that I needed it. I didn't know how to reach out for it. Um, I was going through a lot of things at that time uh, in my life, personally and otherwise. And uh, so I knew that the day was coming, but I, I was not reconciled to being able to, to quit or to reach out to others to uh, find out how I could do that. I had had a short stint of probation um, for a, actually a, a weed uh, marijuana violation. And uh, there was uh, the notion of rehab and uh, uh, doing UAs, but there again I was able to uh, fulfill that need or uh, someone AA would call it a dry drunk. I was able to always stop things long enough to get me to where I was free again. Uh, I had that going for me all my life. I think that's why it took me to 50 to, to really come to my knees. But in the interim, I, I, I was raised in a Christian family, but I never knew who God was. I never read the Bible, and I never uh, really understood who Jesus Christ was. So in the last go around, last turnaround, I think what, uh, what actually accomplished it for me was I uh, got arrested, and uh, that would have been on uh, May 4, 2000. Uh, seven, which is my sober date. Uh, I've actually apologized to that SWAT team on my 10th year anniversary for having put them to the grief, you know, an amends, if you will. Uh, you know, they, they had to have their job. It took a while, but anyway, that's how I got sober. And in the interim, I was in uh, CJC here. I had been uh, extradited to Colorado. I had uh, some uh, issues of, uh, that were family related and uh, and uh, so I had to face some uh, charges for, uh, essentially for stalking my brother. Uh, but anyway, in, in leaving the case history out of it, while I was in CJC, I realized that I needed a brand new way to live. So uh, a Gideon uh, came to CJC and he gave us little pocket Bibles. And I still carry that pocket Bible with me to this day. Uh, I carry it to church and when I do devotions, I, I have that because that's where I put my... Uh, my call, my call to faith is when I got born again was December 28th in 2009 in CJC. So it was a jailhouse conversion, you know, and many people have jailhouse conversions, and you probably hear that pretty much all the time. But uh, different than most, when I left the gate, I took Jesus with me. I didn't leave him at the gate. So uh, he's been a part of my life ever since then. Uh, because in reading that, I read all the things that I were missing in my life because I reached that point of desperation where I truly thought I was going to live or die. Now, once I was born again, I noticed a sign, and this is when things made a real turn. Obviously, things turned that day, but I didn't get an aha moment or, you know, a resounding flash. It wasn't like, uh, you know, God just audibly spoke to me. It was just a simple, you know, confession of, you know, Lord, I need you, and I'm, I'm just a sinner, and my life is a mess, and I don't know how to live, and could you help me, would you help me, and 
and uh, and he did, and he and he and he will. Uh, if he'll help me, he'll help anybody. But I saw a sign on the wall. Uh, there was very little to read in in jail, and I saw a sign on the wall across the room that said "Broken Men Wanted," and I thought, well, that's kind of odd. So I walked over to look at it, and in the uh, in the uh, signage, what it had talked about was Springs Rescue Mission as a program of recovery uh, for essentially alcoholism, uh, drug addiction, and brokenheartedness. So when I saw that sign, I said, well, that's really me. Uh, my case hadn't been resolved, but I wasn't too concerned. I you know, wasn't like the, you know, the biggest, baddest guy in the West. It was just, you know, just a lot of stupidity. And then I, I figured it could be solved, but it wouldn't solve the problems of my life. And now I'm in Colorado, a state that I have never been in because I was brought here. And I thought to myself, I need a brand new life. And, th and that's what, you know, when you get born again, it's, you know, uh, any man who believes in Jesus is a new creation. You know, the old is gone, and behold, everything's brand new. So in needing that brand new life, I figured there, I needed to find a way to live it. So the Bible taught me, basically, how to do that. But I also needed a place to, to do some healing because I, I was uh, pretty much done. And when I saw that sign that said I'd come here for a year to a year and a half program, I actually asked the court as part of a plea if I could be sent here. I mean, they told me I could go to Salvation Army for 30, 60 days uh, to another rehab in Pueblo. I said, well, no, I really want to go to the Springs Rescue Mission. Uh, and they said, well, that's like a year long. I said, well, actually, the sign said a year and a half. And, you know, it may take two, you know. <laughs> They said, well, if that's what you want, then, you know, you can have it. And I said, well, thank you, you know, and I came here. And uh, it was the best decision that I ever made because uh, here's where I really got grounded in Scripture and because what I really needed was it wasn't a matter of facing the responsibility of, of uh, my future life or economics. Grant you, I, you know, I started off pretty much 10000 in the hole, uh, court case and a felony that I caught that I'll probably keep for the rest of my life. And five years probation, no job, didn't think I'd ever work again, didn't know if I'd own a Pinto. But I thought to myself, well, I gotta start somewhere. So I started here. And uh, I'm giving my will and my life over to God, you know, as like step three says in AA, uh, having been born again, uh, everything began to change. And as I read scripture, I realized the things that I had been lacking in my life before. Because my vision uh, going into this was, I have two choices, I can live or I can die. And I didn't want to die, but I also knew that I did not know how to live. So I, in reading, basically the Gideon's Bible is a Psalms, uh, Proverbs, and a New Testament. In reading the New Testament and the Gospel of Christ and the words that Jesus actually spoke, this is the first time I actually was introduced to Jesus Christ or had knowledge of him. And prior, I had gone to church, and you know, and, but I, I wasn't involved, you know, and when I had him in my life, then I, I felt that sense of involvement inside of me personally. And the words that he spoke were actually the guides that I needed for this new way to live. You know, forgiveness was a big thing for me because, uh, again, my issue was family related. So there was some animosity between myself and a sibling. And it took a long time to let that go. Uh, but again, it's required. You know, if you don't forgive others, the Lord God will not forgive you. So in the end, uh, my family got restored with my brother. All my relationships uh, with other people came back. Uh, my court case went away because when you do the right thing, uh, they get bored and they just kind of let you go. And that part was, you know, a given. <laughs> and, uh, but really, uh, what I learned was uh, this, this new life, it, it's incredible. I was just telling some friends of mine the other day, you know, if somebody had told me 12 years ago that I would be working at a Christian ministry, uh, and that I would be running sober homes and working on a board of directors for homeless outreach, take AA into the prisons and be an assistant pastor at a church, I would have said, well, what are you smoking and why am I not? But that's how God works. You see, none of these things, my life has worked out in so many ways to such a blessing. It is just miraculous, absolutely miraculous. And it started off slow. It was never easy, uh, very, very slow. But over a while, time, I've been blessed with so many things. I think it's, you know, to who's given much, much will be required. But before he'll trust you with much, he's just going to have to trust you with a little. And I just basically locked on to him and just let him follow. My life's, it's not my life anymore. And it's just a beautiful life. I just can't really tell you.
Well, the blood of the Lamb would be the blood of Jesus, and you know, through His blood, I yeah, I have a poster in my office. I've had it since I've been here. It says uh, it's got a red cross on it with a couple of drops coming off, and it says, "My life was saved by a blood donor." And then it's Matthew. It's you know, His blood was poured out for the remission of the sins of many. So when I think of the blood of the Lamb, I you know, I think that we were all saved by Jesus' sacrifice at Calvary. You know, He died on the cross for all of us. No greater love does a man have than to lay down his life for another. Sometimes I've posted that to other people and they go, really, your life was saved by a blood donor? I'm like, well, read the small print. It wasn't an actual transfusion, but, you know, because uh, that's, that's really God's sacrifice for all of us, you know. And, and, your and your testimony, you know, God is light. Uh, his light shines through men. And by our testimony, his light is brought to other men. So I basically feel like uh, my story, although it's not anything unique, it's not anything... Uh, you know, it's not uh, anything special, but it is a, a story of redemption. You know, I tell people, everybody has a story. We talked about, you know, we weren't going to discuss war stories. We all have those, you know, we all have those stories. But what makes it a testimony is the redemption, you know, and the redemption and the turning away and the new life that's created from those ashes, you know, from the ashes of rise of Phoenix, that's a secular way of kind of explaining it. But the new life that we have is what we need to let other people know about because that's where life begins. Um, well, I, there weren't too many bridges that I needed to burn. Uh, the, they were all kind of bridges that I had created on my own. So I wasn't trying to separate myself from evil people in my past. Um, well, when I came here, as I said, I was extradited. I did have an advantage because I selected my friends here were a whole new set of friends. But I'm well aware of the environment we're in and, and where we're located right now. Five minutes after leaving CJC to come here, I could see if there was something I wanted to find. It's right here, too. Wherever you go, you're still there. So the bridges I burned were the bridges inside of me. But the restoration, again, I, I had a serious problem uh, with my brother. Uh, I was able to forgive my brother. Uh, and I forgave him uh, as soon as the day I got off probation. Uh, it, it's odd how God works. Um, in restoration. I tell people, um, I tell people that, you know, a broken relationship is like a broken bone, you know, and you have to set your side and the other person has to set theirs and then you let God sort of do the healing. So there was nothing I could do to get my brother's side of the plate to come to me, but what I could do is go to him and make, make things right. Uh, he's my only blood brother. I love him very much. He's gone now. He passed away three years ago. But before that happened, we were able to talk and we were able to make peace. And greater than that, he had a, a problem with his family as well. And I was able to get his daughter and his son in the room with him on his last day here on earth. And the tears that were expressed by both of them, I, to this day, even though I was just a witness to it, not a part of it, I think that had greater value than just my brother and I getting back together. Because that's, that's a huge thing for a mother and a father. Well, you, you just said it in the question. The first thing I'm going to tell them is that I love them, you know. I'm going to tell them that I love them and that I don't, uh, yeah. Here's the thing, I've known some people who made it and some who haven't. I've spent a lot of people, times with people trying to get them to find a better way and, and sometimes it hasn't worked. Uh, we all wish that we could just lay hands on people and make things come out the way that Christ could make them happen, but yet we're, we're still humans and, and so we struggle to be able to do it be that miraculous. Uh, I think for me the most important thing is to let them know first that I love them, that I care about them, that I'm not judgmental of their situation. There's nothing they're going to do that will stop me from being their friend or care about them. And that if they need help, that I can help them or help them find the help that they need. And we willingly go with them to achieve that help. Whether it be a meeting, whether it be to church, whether it be talking about God. Uh, outreach, uh, detox, whatever is required, you know, just to get them started. And then basically you, you got you to gotta stay with that process. It's, it's a long road to reconstruct it for a lot of people. And really, if you're going to make that commitment to an individual, uh, it's not to really be done lightly. You may find yourself pretty much with a full-time job. But if you love that person, you'll, you'll make that time. No, it's, my, it's always been my wish that I can... Uh, I've received a gift. I've, I've received, you know, I've received the gift of life, you know, a brand new life. I mean, I'm, uh, 
62 now, I was 50 when I got sober. Uh, a lot of my arrogance, ego, and pride, and, and ability to manipulate the world and have things in life is probably why it took me to 50. If I could encourage anybody to get this, I would love it if they'd get it when they're 20. Uh, don't wait till you're 50, because 62 is not like 50, and it sure ain't 40. Sure doesn't feel like 30, you know. And uh, my dream was fantasy, if you will. I, it, a more delusional thought was if I'm sober at 50, I'd like to get to 85, because I started at 14, 15. I'd like to see what the next 35 years are like compared to the first you know, part two, so to speak, kind of like Paul Harvey. What will the rest of the story be like? But truthfully, if I was gone tomorrow, because no day's promised, these 12 years have been better than those 35. You know, and I anticipate they'll continue to be that way, just in a different way. I'm getting older. I mean, you know, pretty soon I'll, I'll be geriatric, and that's a whole different set of, you know, <laughs> conditions in life. But, but I'm happy, you know, and, and my, my soul's at peace. And uh, I know that, uh, you know, my, my issues were related to, a probate uh, and a blessing, but the life that I lead today is the blessing that my parents wanted me to have. So truthfully, uh, you can have little and have more than, than anybody else. And I see a lot of folks that I've known for years that, that have all the things that I thought that I wanted, that many addicts look back and regret not having. And I realize in talking to them that their lives are actually empty. They want to have my life because of what I do. And I look at them and I go, well, you could have that, but you don't want to go through what I want to, to get it. You know? You've got a family and a wife and a kid. So I, I would just say that I would hope that I could pass along the gift of uh, sober living, the gift of having Jesus Christ in my life and the love of God. You know, if it's, I guess my wish for everybody would just be a prayer that I said when I was a child at my, at my dinner table. Uh, my mom called it grace, but it was actually a little catechism prayer I learned in Dublin, Ireland. And I would just say, you know what, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of our Father God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and everyone throughout the rest of the days of your life. And I think with that, then this whole world would be in a so much better place. My name is Robert. This is my story. <laughs> Thanks for watching Overcomers TV. Yeah.